I would like to introduce Dr. Mark S. Davis from Florida. Uh, Dr. Davis is an operating room safety consultant. Uh, he has written a book which is currently available on Amazon.com entitled Irresponsible, What Surgeons Won't Tell You and How to Protect Yourself. Specifically, he'll be talking about exposing patients to both HIV and hepatitis C during surgical procedures and how this exposure is unnecessary and could be prevented by using proper surgical technique and proper instrumentation. So at this time, I'd like to turn the program over to Dr. Davis. I'm grateful to have this opportunity to discuss a little known but extremely important and hidden health risk for surgical patients. While there may be a handful of physicians in the audience, I'm addressing my remarks to the general public for their protection. The health risk that I'm going to discuss today is the exposure of patients to HIV, hepatitis C, and other pathogens during their surgical procedures, which can lead to infection with one or more of these potentially deadly diseases. The reality is that all of us and our family members will be surgical patients. And so this is something that everyone needs to know about. Uh, speaking as a surgeon with 40 years in the OR and as an OR safety consultant, I can tell you that the surgical community has failed to do enough to reduce or eliminate this health threat. But there are some things that patients and the public can do, and I believe must do, if they want to protect themselves. As far as disclosures, I have no relationship with the manufacturers of surgical safety devices, some of which I will show you today, or the companies that sell them. And the material in this presentation is taken from my book, Irresponsible, What Surgeons Won't Tell You and How to Protect Yourself. So we're dealing with uh, essentially a hidden risk of surgery, something that, that does not appear on preoperative consent forms. So we'll talk about uh, what this potentially dead, deadly risk is, whether it's preventable, if so, how. And I will show you that surgeons have the knowledge and the technology to greatly reduce or eliminate this risk, but they often choose not to act. And we'll look at why that is the case. And the game changer has to be transparency, inform patients and consumer pressure. And I will tell you what patients can do and must do to, in order to protect themselves. So I feel the public needs to know that you could become infected with HIV or hepatitis during your surgery. Um, these are commonly found diseases among surgical patients. Many patients don't know that they're infected uh, U.S. surgeons and their assistants are injured with needles, scalpels, and other sharp objects uh, 1,000 times a day. That's an astonishing statistic. Um, and this exposes them to the blood of potentially infected patients. As a result, surgeons may become infected with HIV and or hepatitis C. They could also become infected with these diseases in more traditional ways. But they may not know that they're infected for months or years. And then an infected surgeon can transmit HIV or hepatitis to healthy surgical patients down the road during future surgical procedures. Um, HIV and hepatitis C can also be transmitted to healthy patients via contaminated instruments and devices such as colonoscopes and dialysis equipment. Well, let's look at the cost of these 1,000 daily preventable events, sharp object injuries, which expose people to blood. Well, uh, the obvious uh, main concern is that care providers, surgeons and their assistants, and patients may become infected. Now we're dealing with anxiety, stress, shock, pain and suffering, whether people actually get infected or not. Because blood testing can take up to six months to find out if you've been infected with HIV after an exposure. These are not a pleasant uh, six months to go through. 
Now, these sharp object injuries cost the healthcare system more than a billion dollars annually for lab tests, medications, counseling, staff replacement, and other costs. As I mentioned, we are all going to be surgical patients. We're living longer, and they're finding ways to correct things surgically that did not exist several years ago. Um, According to a recent study by the American College of Surgeons, the average American will have over nine surgical procedures in a lifetime. So it's not a question of if, but when. And surgical infections and other errors like operating on the wrong limb or the wrong part of the body are common. Some of these uh, errors can be deadly. So you, the public, can prepare yourself with knowledge and become an empowered safety advocate for yourself or a family member or a friend. As a consumer of health care, you have power to protect yourself. Will you use that power? I hope that you will. So the OR is a risky place for the patient and the surgical team. Um, in one study of an urban sur surgical practice, uh, HIV, hepatitis C, and hepatitis B was commonly found in 38% of patients. Uh, this happened to be in, in the city of Baltimore. Uh, specifically, 26% of patients were infected with HIV. In other words, they came in with that infection before their surgery. 35% uh, had hepatitis C. 17% had both HIV and hepatitis C a particularly dangerous uh, combination. And even hepatitis B, 4% uh, were found to have. Now, surgeons usually do not report their injuries. And by so doing, they deprive themselves of the opportunity to receive post-exposure treatment to prevent HIV and to diagnose hepatitis C early, where treatment is effective. After a surgeon becomes infected and subsequently is injured again, let's say months later, and his bleeding hand then recontacts that healthy patient's internal tissues, the CDC calls this a recontact, then that patient may become infected. So this patient walked into the hospital basically healthy, maybe to have an appendix removed, and walks out with HIV potentially. This risk does not appear on surgical consent forms, and it is certainly not discussed preoperatively with patients. It basically is a secret, and it's kept that way. Let me give you some examples of cases that have occurred. Um, the first known uh, transmission of uh, HIV from a care provider to patients occurred in the late 1980s. On the, the, near the beginning of the HIV epidemic. And this was a Florida dentist who infected um, five of his patients uh, with HIV. In 1999, in France, an orthopedic surgeon who was infected with AIDS uh, transmitted HIV to a patient during a hip replacement. In 2003, an obstetrician in Spain transmitted HIV to a patient during a C-section. And from 1991 to 2005, worldwide, 11 surgeons infected with hepatitis C transmitted their infections to 38 patients, including 14 in the United States. And 12 surgeons infected with hepatitis B transmitted their infections to 91 patients, including 19 in the United States. And you have to wonder, is this the tip of the iceberg? Then moving forward from 2005 until last year, 2015, in multiple reported exposure incidents, hundreds to thousands of patients, up to 10,000 in one particular incident, were or may have been exposed to HIV and or hepatitis C during colonoscopy, dialysis, and surgical procedures due to improper cleaning and sterilization of equipment and needle sticks and scalpel cuts the surgeon. Now, I call these events never events um, because they are tragic. They should never happen. 
and they should never happen because they are mostly preventable. There is a variety of safety devices which have been developed uh, by the industry, and these have been shown to prevent most sharp injuries and exposures to blood. There is a federal law called the Needle Stick Safety and Prevention Act, passed in 2000, uh, which states that employers, meaning in our case, surgical medical facilities, must provide for their employees to use safety engineered injection needles, safety blood draw needles, safety IV catheters. Uh, these devices all have safety sheaths on them, as well as safety scalpels, which have sheaths that cover the blade when it's not in use, and blunt tip suture needles, which I'll go into in more detail. Now, here's the catch. Uh, the law says the hospital has to provide these, but surgeons are not obligated to use them if, in their opinion, they interfere with patient care. Well, I think that's a good, a good way to go. But I can tell you, uh, from my experience, in most cases, they don't interfere with patient care. Um, there may be instances where, let's say, a sheath on a scalpel blade interferes with visibility. Well, in that case, if I'm the surgeon, I'm going to ask for the old-fashioned, more dangerous scalpel. Um, and uh, But if that only happens 3 or 5% of the time, then I'm still doing a good job with safety. But in spite of this, only 5 to 10% uh, percent of surgeons use these safety devices. Let me show you uh, some of the evidence for the effectiveness of safety devices in preventing injuries and exposure to blood. First thing is a blunt tip suture needle. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Uh, in an early CDC study, there was a 0% needle stick injury rate compared with a 6% needle stick rate with traditional sharp suture needles. 6% of the time, people were getting stuck. Um, that is not good. Now, um, based on this study and many other studies, the American College of Surgeons in 2005 issued their bulletin statement on blunt suture needles, which says, all published studies to date, and there have been many, have demonstrated that the use of blunt suture needles can substantially reduce or eliminate needle stick injuries from surgical needles. The ACS supports the universal adoption of blunt suture needles as the first choice for fascial suturing, that is, closing of incision. Now, you can't close the skin portion of the incision with a blunt needle. It doesn't go through skin, so uh, that's how it protects the surgeon. But you can close all the layers below the skin. Uh, similar endorsements followed uh, this bulletin, uh, including the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, the perioperative uh, OR nurses, the surgical technologists, the Association of uh, Surgical Physi Physician Assistants, and OSHA and even the FDA have issued bulletins saying that these devices, the blunt su suture needle, uh, should be used. Surgeon compliance. 5%. This is based on the percentage of sales of blunt noodle, uh, needles compared to sharp needles. Um, information I received from the people that manufacture the needles. Now here, this is a photo of me trying to make a hole in my finger with a blunt tip suture needle, and I can't do it. This was an early version, which was really, really blunt. They've made them less blunt to make them more attractive to surgeons. Um, but uh, surgeons have not caught on yet. Next thing uh, I'd like to mention is the way we pass sharp instruments between nurses and surgeons and assistants. Um, we should do it through, that is, instead of passing them from hand to hand, uh, we put them in a, in a tray or on a mat, and I'll show you a picture in a minute, um, and this prevents all the collisions that occur when you pass them from hand to hand. Let's face it, the OR is a very brisk, uh, has a very brisk pace, and uh, there's a lot of speed and collisions. 
And uh, we know that half of all scalpel injuries, which are the second most common type of injury, and a quarter of all suture needle injuries, which is the most common type of injury, occur when these sharps are passed from hand to hand. And studies have shown that using a neutral zone reduced collisions and sharp object injuries significantly. Uh, what is the situation from one hospital to next? It's sporadic. Some hospitals use them, some surgeons do, some don't. Some use them part of the time, uh, not all the time. So there's much room for improvement there. This is uh, just one example of a, a way to do it. Uh, let's say the surgeon has asked for a scalpel from the nurse. She's placed it in this tray, let's, or it could be a mat. Uh, the surgeon takes it out, retracts this safety sheet, uh, uses the scalpel, puts it back in the tray, and the nurse, is retrie the nurse retrieves it. Uh, and so collisions are avoided. Next thing I'd like to mention is the practice of double gloving. Wearing two pair of gloves instead of one uh, by the surgeon and assistants reduces the risk of exposure to patient's blood in multiple studies by as much as 87%. And so the American College of Surgeons, again, recommends the universal adoption of double gloving. Orthopedists like to do it. Uh, some other types of surgeons don't. So surgeon compliance varies. And when surgeons take their gloves off at the end of the case, there's a fair chance they're going to see blood on their hands. Does that blood contain the HIV or hepatitis C virus? Who knows? Uh, the fourth thing I'd like to mention are safety scalpels. Now, there have been few studies that are definitive that these are effective, but if you think about it intuitively, if you have a scalpel with a sheath on it when it's not in use, um, it's got to be safer. And anecdotally, I can tell you that these things work. Um, out of 40 years in the OR, my first 30 years, I was uh, stuck pretty regularly with needles at least three, three times a year. And I've had uh, probably a half dozen scalpel injuries. In the last 10 years of my practice, there were no such injuries uh, since we switched to safety scalpels in my OR as well as um, blood suture needles. Now these do not interfere with, interfere with patient care in most situations. But again, we have resistance by surgeons. They say things like they don't feel the same as the traditional less safe ones do. And in many cases they don't. They could be a lightweight plastic one that certainly doesn't feel like a, a metal scalpel. And so surgeon compliance is quite low, again, probably 5% or less. Here is uh, one a version of the safety scalpel. And what this uh, company did was make the handle uh, metal so as, and to make it as close as possible to the traditional scalpel in shape, size, and weight. And then they have a module that clips on, and that module has a safety. So um, the objection that they don't feel the same as a regular scalpel really doesn't apply. So what we've uh, witnessed here are multiple missed opportunities to protect the patient and the surgical team from exposure to disease. Um, safety scalpels and blunt safety suture needles have been available. They can prevent a majority, the vast majority, of the thousand injuries daily that we uh, see occurring. Now, why don't surgeons use these more often? I can tell you they use them in Japan all the time. There's a different culture of safety there, apparently. But in the United States, we have resistance to change on the part of surgeons. Everyone's resistance to change, but it seems like surgeons are a little more stubborn than the rest. And the other problems include the fact that OSHA, who is supposed to enforce um, use of these safety devices does not have the manpower to do that. There are very few OSHA inspectors, and if uh, there is an inspection and a deficiency is found, uh, there may be a penalty, and the fine may be reduced through negotiation. So there's very little teeth in this. 
The other problem that I see uh, is that uh, facility administrators and hospital executives don't confront surgeons. Surgeons bring patients to hospitals that are a source of income. So um, there is a lack of a strong culture of safety in many hospitals. So the only solution left, and the reason I wrote the book, is consumer pressure. So here's what patients need to do. Um, they need to find, uh, find out about the risks and then apply the pressure that they have. Patients need to speak up. As one popular book title it says, speak up and stay alive. Um, that author doesn't pull any punches. So you have to ask questions. You have to challenge care providers uh, to follow safe practices. And you can demand safe health care because um, you deserve it. So it's okay to say something like, in addition to washing your hands, I'd like you to use safety devices during my surgery. Um, and by the way, um, studies show that care providers are more likely to wash their hands when they know patients are watching, and certainly when they, they're asked to do so. So you need to be your own safety advocate. You may be the patient one day. You may be accompanying a patient to have surgery. Um, it's great to be your own safety advocate, but I would say bring another one with you because when you're the patient, you're very nervous, you don't hear anything, you're intimidated. Um, so whether it's the, the doctor's office, the hospital, surgery center, or other type of clinic, uh, bring a safety advocate with you. And this can prevent many, many deadly medical errors, not just infections. And I recommend in my book that patients develop or use safety checklists of their own. I've developed a checklist. You don't have to develop them. Here's one such checklist, one of six at the end of my book. Um, and this is called What You Must Ask a Surgeon the First Time You Meet. So the first time you meet a surgeon, he's evaluating you. He's trying to figure out what's wrong with you, make a diagnosis, and determine whether you need tests, whether you need surgery you're also evaluating the surgeon. And so it's okay to ask, and I think it's essential to ask, do you use blunt tip suture needles to close your incisions? I've been doing some reading, and I understand that uh, this helps prevent injuries and exposure to blood. Do you use a neutral zone for passing your sharps? Do you double glove routinely? Do you and your OR team all use protective eyewear? And do you use safety scalpels? at least part of the time. Um, and the time to ask these questions is on the first meeting because you're shopping for a surgeon, basically. And I think that you can always get a second opinion if you get an answer, something like, well, I don't attach much importance to this or I've never had a problem, then I think it is time to go down the street for your second opinion. But my feeling and my hope is that you're going to help convert this surgeon to a safer surgeon because it would be totally reasonable for that surgeon to answer your questions. Um, if you'd like me to do that, I'd be very glad to. It protects you and it protects me. But you can't ask this once you're on the gurney being wheeled into the OR, and then it's too late. So what I hope to, uh, that I've done today in a clear uh, manner is uh, to tell you about a hidden risk of surgery. And that risk is exposure to HIV and hepatitis C, which is mostly preventable, uh, and that surgeons must change their dangerous behavior. The healthcare system uh, has failed to make that happen from within. So the only solution I see that's left is for the informed patient to be a uh, consumer advocate apply the pressure, uh, we know that works, so that patients, i.e. the public, all of us will be patients one day, need to know what to ask. And if you ask the right questions and speak up to protect yourself, your family member, and even protect your surgeon, he or she will thank you or should thank you uh, because uh, <laughs> it's nothing but helpful. 
if anyone would like to correspond with me, I've got my email address under the link to the book here, msdavismd.aol.com, and I'll be happy to entertain some questions.